So I'm going to be talking about quantum mechanics and quantum computing in particular. First of all, imagine there's a maze. Only one exit and millions of other dead ends. You're at the center of this maze. You don't know the way out. So you'll start exploring each exit one by one. And after millions of tries and years of time, perhaps, you'll finally discover the correct way out. This method is kind of how like modern computers, just like your laptop works. Now imagine once again that you have millions of exact clones of you along with you. You and your clones start exploring the pots all together, all at the same time. And because all the clones are exploring all possible ways together, one of your clones will find the exit in the first try itself. Thus, you have a super fast solution in the first try. Your clones that navigate all the ways at once are your superposition states. You are present basically at many points at the same time. And that is a quantum computer. Let me explain. In Semicon West 2013 convention, applied materials detailed a road beyond technological innovations below 14 nanometers down to 3 nanometers and beyond. Future transistors may become so tiny they may actually reach the atomic realm. This is governed by Moore's law, and it's made by the Intel co-founder Gordon Moore. It says that processor speeds will double every two years. And to break this law down even further, it states that the number of transistors on an affordable piece of CPU will double every two years. Thus, transistor size significantly decreases. Transistors work like an on and off switch, blocking or conducting a flow of electrons to represent zeros or ones, bits, in computers. However, a phenomenon known as quantum tunneling no, causes major problems when we get down to the picometer scale, or 1 into 10 to the power minus 12 meters. Quantum mechanics only really shows effects on this atomic scale, but if Moore's laws continues, quantum tunneling will cause a crisis known as leakage current between two metal transistor electrodes. This occurs if the gap between the electrodes narrows to a point where electrons are no longer contained by their barriers. In the tiny quantum world, particles behave like waves. If a quantum wave encounters a barrier, it will not end abruptly. Rather, its amplitude will exponentially decrease. This drop in amplitude corresponds to an equivalent drop in probability. And therefore, it means there's a drop in probability of finding the particle deeper and deeper into the barrier. If the barrier is thin enough, then the amplitude may have a non-zero value on the other side. Therefore, there's a finite probability that some particles will tunnel through the barrier. This is quantum tunneling, the barrier in our case being the transistor. Thus, quantum tunneling means electron flow within quantum transistors can no longer be controlled. So, as you can see, this is a diagram of quantum tunneling in a in transistors, where the transistor is represented by our barrier. And in the quantum world, particles can be represented by waves, for example, here. And these quantum processes have been utilized to create a new type of computer that discards traditional transistors and ensures they will have no size limits. Before I describe specifically how quantum mechanics has revolutionized computing, let me tell you of numerous practical applications of these. Each of these different aspects is important to the development of quantum computers. Each discovery was combined to produce this computing revolution. One such application is laser technology. It was first introduced in the 1917 paper by Albert Einstein on the statistics of photons, particles of light, and their interaction with atoms. This introduces the idea of stimulated emission, where an atom of an incredibly high energy state encounters a photon at the right wavelength and is induced to emit a second photon identical to the first. This process is responsible for two of the words, uh, two of the letters in the word laser, originally an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Computer devices such as are such as the laser mouse, laser presentations that this TED is on, CD-ROMs, DVD-ROMs, astronomy, computer application, medicine, surgery, all etc. are all using laser applications. Moreover, for our purposes in quantum computing, this quantum description of light and its subsequent interactions with matter allows us to treat particles of light as individual bits. This discovery by Richard Feynman in 1982, Yuri Manin in 1980, David Dutch in 1985, all independently, 
found that photons can be used to represent individual bits, ones and zeros. And the, the interactions between light and matter that allows us to perform operations on such computers. The method of differentiating between zero and one using particles of light is using a property known as spin. So spin is an, in, is an intrinsically quantum phenomenon, causing electrons, protons, and neutrons that make up ordinary matter to behave like tiny magnets. The spin was first used in MRIs or magnetic resonance imaging. The central process in an MRI machine is called nuclear magnetic resonance and works by flipping the spins, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms. Spin can't be thought of as an ordinary spin like a tabletop spin, however. Again, it's, it's an intrinsically quantum phenomenon. And a clever arrangement of magnetic fields inside of an MRI lets doctors measure the concentration of hydrogen appearing in different parts of the body, which in turn distinguishes a lot of the softer tissues in the body that traditional x-rays can't see. The first MRI was used in 1977, and since then, the aspect of being able to shift between the spin states in a quantum computer that has allowed photons or electrons that can be utilized as bits. And they're either in two states, spin up or one in binary, or spin down or zero in binary. These advances would not be possible without the theoretical foundation and discoveries of these quantum properties. At this stage, quantum computing was still in its extreme infancy. Particles of light could be used as bits, and quantum computing um, <coughs> was extremely successful so far. However, since the particles of light could be used as bits, they themselves were the on and off switches, so no traditional transistors were required. Yet there was still another revolution to come. I'll tell you about two earlier discoveries that have contributed towards a revolution called quantum computing, superposition and entanglement. Superposition refers to a combination of states that we would ordinarily describe independently. To make a classical analogy, if you play two musical notes at once, what you're going to hear is a superposition of the two notes. Hence, superposition is the ability of a quantum system to be in multiple states at the same time until measured. British polymath and physician Thomas Young's 1801 double slit experiment is an example of this. A beam of light is aimed at a barrier, in this case a screen, uh, having two vertical slits. The light passes through the slits and the resulting pattern is recorded on a screen. When one slit is covered, the pattern on the full screen is what would be expected. A single line of light aligned with whichever slit is open. Um, <coughs> yeah, aligned. And so, however, one would expect that if both slits are open, uh, the pattern of light would reflect two lines of light aligned with their respective slits. In fact, what happens, however, is that on the photographic plate, it separates into multiple areas of light and dark in varying degrees. The result shows that interference is taking place between the waves going through the slits. Constructive interference, causing areas of bright light, and destructive interference, causing areas of darkness. And so each photon goes through both slits and simultaneously takes every possible trajectory en route to the photographic plate. This is superposition. The photons are in multiple positions at the same time. However, once the photon collides with the screen, this triggers the photon to randomly collapse into one possible trajectory and thus one point on the screen. And thus, if we use electrons as particles that represent ones or zeros in a quantum computer, the electrons are known as qubits. A qubit is a quantum bit, which can hold both zero and one at the same time in a superposition. In fact, a qubit can hold any combination of any number between zero and one inside quantum computers. And therefore, the possible states for a qubit are one, zero, both, and any combination of in-between. At one particular time, a bit can hold either zero or one, whereas a qubit, again, can hold both. So theoretically, a single qubit can take part in millions of processes at a single time. The qubit's flexibility allows quantum computers to do multiple calculations simultaneously. Calculations that require millions of bits in our traditional computers can be accomplished much faster with only 32 qubits. Entanglement, first described in the einstein podolsky rosen paradox from 1935, is a counterintuitive quantum phenomenon describing behavior we'd never really see in the classical world. 
For example, it's possible to prepare two entangled particles in a single quantum sti state such that whenever you observe one entangled particle to be spin up, the other will always be observed to be spin down, and vice versa, even though it should be classically impossible to predict which set of measurements would be observed. Therefore, if you place the particles in separate containers and place one on the Earth and the other at the edge of the galaxy and observe that the particles in one box is spin up, the other will instantaneously collapse to spin down. And so this always holds, no matter what the distance separating the particles. For example, Google's quantum computer used entangled particles to perform computing tasks. Quantum computers could also execute certain algorithms much faster because entangled particles can hold and manipulate exponentially more information than regular computing bits. Quantum entanglement could also be useful in securing data. Currently, researchers are developing cryptographic protocols based on entangled particles. And in the future, to send a secure message to someone, you'd encrypt your message using the entangled quantum particles, and then you'd send, it, your, you'd send your intended recipient the key. If the hacker tries to intercept a key, or if the key was defective in the first place, you'd be able to see it on the collapsed quantum particles on your side. Remember, any measurement collapses the superposition. And so you know that your encrypted message is no longer secure. To give an idea of the speed of a quantum computer, let's think about prime factorization. Given a number, say 8181, we can find out the prime factors through this easily with mathematics. So the, in this case, it's 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 101. But this would be much harder for a computer to accomplish. Take a much larger number, say 8181818. Eight. Prime factorization is 2 times 19 times 139 times 1549. This would take a pretty long time on a classical computer. And more specifically, let's just say that the number you want to factorize is n. The time that the classical computer would require to compute the result is basically exponential with the size of n. Some of the fastest classical algorithms can compute the value in n squared time. Therefore, factoring becomes increasingly time consuming as n grows. And however, using an algorithm designed to run on quantum computers, such as Shor's algorithm, named after Peter Wilson Shor, a uh, professor of applied mathematics at MIT, we can calculate the prime factors of such numbers in a polynomial event. This means that as opposed to taking n squared minutes, it could just take two n minutes, meaning that extremely large codes could be broken down in a matter of minutes or hours, whereas on a classical computer, it could take days to crack such a code. Shor's algorithm itself is based on many interesting quantum phenomena. The algorithm is composed of two parts. The first part of the algorithm turns the factoring problem that I just talked about into the problem of finding the period of a function. I'll explain that. And it may be implemented classically. The second part finds the period using something called a quantum Fourier transformation, or QFT, and it's responsible for the speed increase. The QFT takes some function, say fx, and works out the period of the function. For example, if fx is equal to f of x plus 5, for all x, then the function uh, repeats itself every five values, and we can say that it has a period of five. It does this through the rigorous experimentation, which would be impossible on a classical computer, because a classical computer can only do one experiment at a time. Quantum computers, however, can do all the experiments simultaneously using superposition. And since all the experiments can be done at the same time, it increases speed exponentially. Once we have the period finding mechanism of the QFT, we can exploit it to find patterns in the mathematical structure of the number we're trying to factor, in our case, n. Thus, quantum computers can easily solve massive codes in a minimal amount of time. These developments finally culminated in D-wave quantum computers with 2,000 qubits to spare. To find ideal solutions, researchers first put qubits comprising superconducting loops into their lowest energy state. This cools them down and therefore reduces outside interference, which could disrupt their entanglement. Therefore, each qubit is in a quantum superposition of both on and off. Magnetic fields that represent the problem gently nudge this state towards a new one, a process known as quantum annealing, and then the state evolves while maintaining its low energy and temperature, such that when it finally uh, collapses, it should leave the qubits in the best configuration for solving that problem. Because the system goes through every possible answer all at once, in theory, it might be quicker to resolve problems that when solved classically get exponentially harder with each and every added variable. 
Google and NASA are installing the D-Wave qubit system at NASA's Ames Research Center for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. NASA has used D-Wave quantum computers for robotics missions in space, and Google has used it for search, image labeling, and voice recognition. IBM's quantum computer is specifically targeted at scientific applications, like quantum dynamics and material sciences that require immense processing power. So there's no doubt that quantum strangeness is all re set to revolutionize future computing. However, quantum computing is still in its infancy. We simply cannot keep the qubits in their entangled state for very long. This limits the time we can use them and thus limits the size of the problems we can tackle. And so this means that quantum computers will potentially be used to solve very specific problems that classical computers are not accurate enough to do. This means that quantum computers will more likely augment our existing computing arsenal and won't solve every single computing problem. So unfortunately, therefore, it's unlikely that you'll be using a quantum computer as a laptop. However, there are quantum computers that can be accessed via the cloud right now to aid in, in complex calculations. For example, IBM has a quantum computer that is available right now to use from your own laptop and can be accessed wirelessly for simulations. While quantum computers can solve a range of problems, there are a few that will definitely be revolutionized by these computers. One such issue is predicting market behavior. For nearly a century, one of the essential tools for the study of economics has been sophisticated models of market behavior in hopes of predicting important disruptive events to the broader economy such as financial crises. Again, quantum computers can leverage superposition and predict multiple market simulations all at once to find out if a crash could occur in the near future. And they can do this much faster than classical computers due to the methods we just discussed. And when chemists research new medicines, much of their work is testing hundreds of possible variables in a chemical formula in order to find the desired characteristic to treat varieties of illnesses. This strategic process of experimentation, research, and discovery leads to a development time of over 10 years before a new drug is, is introduced into the market, often at a cost of billions of dollars. It is done on computers that likely have to combine and recombine elements over time to test the results. And like financial markets, these variables uh, can be processed simultaneously by a quantum computer and will significantly reduce time and expenditure needed to develop new drugs. And so there's a pattern that can be seen here. In all applications of quantum computing, all the problems that can be solved by such technologies require a magnitude of variables, market simulations, or would otherwise take far too much time on an ordinary computer or a classical computer such as encryption. Hence, it's likely quantum computing is all set to revolutionize our world and it owes a lot to those tiny quantum phenomena that it was based on. The future, therefore, is really quantum, when the bit becomes spooky and when this tiny thing called quantum mechanics makes a huge, colossal impact on the near future. Little things indeed do matter. Thank you.